uh, tonight will be a better night and be a beginning for you. Let's take our hymnal if you need it, or if uh, on the screen we'll have it up just in a moment. We're going to stand and sing all four stanzas of Living by Faith, 162, or look on the screen however you want to. Let's stand as we sing. I care not. I'm leaving. 
Now, how many of you have never sung that song before? Wow. Now you can say you sung it. Amen? And more importantly, you can live it. Living by faith. The Bible says the just, the righteous man shall live by faith. And that's what we're living. To say by faith, walking by faith, and we're going to enter the presence of the Lord one day by faith. Well, good to see you out tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Ask his blessings on our time together tonight. Have a missionary family with us tonight. Be sharing with us in just a few moments. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings on our time together. Father, we love you. We thank you tonight for a life of faith that we can live. We do not live it in our strength, but we live it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you tonight for all of these that have come, turned aside from the cares of life to come and be in the house of God tonight. Those that are watching by live stream, thank you for their tuning in tonight. And I pray, Lord, that we would just meet together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I pray, Lord, as we sing the songs, may they stir our hearts, and then the word of God as it comes forth in a few moments, as we hear from uh, this dear uh, missionary family concerning the work that you're doing there in the Philippines, I pray, Lord, that you would touch our hearts afresh. Father, be with our young people as they meet next door, and I pray that someone would trust Christ tonight. Lord, get honor and glory to yourself through all that is said and done. We praise and thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated just for a moment. And we're going to just mention a couple of uh, prayer or a couple of uh, announcements to you. Uh, this coming Sunday will be our last uh, effective home visitation uh, meeting. Uh, we, of course, are preparing for the following Saturday, which will be our actually going out, beginning our visitation. And so we encourage you, if you can, be with us 9:45 for our training, and then uh, uh, next Saturday, the fifth, we will be meeting here at 10 o'clock and being able to go out and, and make some difference there. And so we'll be saying more about that to you as we get a little bit closer in. But for our young people, uh, this coming Friday, the 25th, from 6 to 8 p.m., and the Family and Life Center for ages 8 through 16 will be there Fired Up Fridays. And so if you have children or grandchildren that would fit in that age group or you know some young people, would love to have them come and have some time of fellowship. They'll have some food, but also a time of being able to share the gospel with them and so you trust you'll pray for that, that God would be honored in that. And then, of course, uh, we've been encouraging you to um, uh, share with us loved ones that you may have that are unsaved or unchurched, and uh, simply fill out one of the uh, index cards. We have those on either side of the uh, auditorium on the speakers or out in the lobby. Just simply fill that out, place it in the basket underneath the um, communion table. We're going to begin, be beginning that uh, the first of next month and be just spending some time give you an opportunity to be able to come take the card back to your seat and just have a moment of prayer praying for those lost loved ones and what a difference it can make and we've seen so many people come to know christ through that means and you get a different card every week so you're rotating you're not going to have the same people necessarily that you're praying for every week but everybody will be prayed for and uh, you know it's, it's it's an encouragement not only for you to pray for for your family and your friends that don't know Christ, but to have other people that are joining together in that and bearing that burden with you and what wonderful uh, results can come because of that. But keep that in mind if you would. And then, of course, on Thursday, March the 3rd, we'll mention this again, Sunday, 6.30 p.m. will be our information question and answer meeting uh, concerning the uh, desire to begin a Christian school and all the members of the church. would uh, We'd love to have you come. We'll have uh, Brother Enoch Wilson, pastor of Lighthouse Baptist Church and also Lighthouse Christian Academy. He'll be here to give us some information as well as we will have the, the SCAC's executive director uh, that will be here as well. So a lot of good things. We had a meeting this week with the ACE uh, representative and uh, we'll have some samples that you can be able to look at. And so come with all of your questions and they will answer them. Uh, not, not the pastor myself, but they will answer them. They're the experts in these fields. And just be praying mainly. We would love uh, for God to uh, raise up a school in this area. The closest uh, Christian school, as far as I know, is Tabernacle, and that's about 20 minutes away. And there's a, a lot of people between here and there. And so pray with us concerning that. We just want the Lord's will concerning that. All right. Uh, we're going to stand and sing once again another song, A New Name Written in Glory. I'm glad that when we're living by faith, that all began with us standing and uh, trusting Christ as our Savior. Let's stand. We'll sing all three stanzas. A new name in glory. 
I was once a sinner, but I came pardoned to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white robed angels sing the story, a sinner. Sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. I was humbly kneeling at the cross, hearing not but God's angry frown. In the heavens open, and I saw that my name was written. our ushers to come and help us in receiving our Wednesday offering and we so appreciate what you give that helps us to be able to uh, continue the work of God here as well as uh, reach around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ through world evangelization and so thank you for that in advance of what you're giving and uh, trust that you will give as the Lord prospers you to do so tonight. Brother Saxon would you come lead us in prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this day. Thank you, God, for everything you do, especially what you did at Calvary, God. And I just thank you, God, for letting us all come out tonight and bless us, God, and bless the ones that didn't get to come, God. Bless them also. And God, if there's one here tonight that don't know you, I pray, God, that they'll go home in a different way. And God, I just ask you to take these tithes and offerings and use them for the uplifting of your kingdom. And I pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
uh, Miss Gina sang. I announced that Miss Gina and Miss Leah were going to sing, and Miss Gina sang. And so I've got on the program tonight that Miss Gina is going to sing and Miss Leah is with. So I'm just all confused. But anyhow, but I'm glad both of us here tonight. All right, so you ladies come and sing for us. She didn't have very much to give, nothing that you could recall. A widow without very much to give, only to my sad soul. But a story came down through the ages how she gave more than she could afford. She didn't have very much to give. But she gave it all to the Lord. Some gave of their abundance, some sacrificially. We must give with a heart of thanks for the blessings we receive. We cast our bread upon the water, watch our blessings come to shore. We may not have very much to give, but we gave it all to the Lord. He didn't have very much to give, a boy with two fish and some bread. He didn't have very much to give, but with it so many were fed. Jesus took what was offered and then he made a miracle as his reward. He didn't have very much to give, but he gave it all to the Lord. Some give up their abundance, some sacrificially. We must give with a heart of thanks for the blessings we receive. We cast our bread upon the water, watch our blessings come to shore. We may not have very much to give, but we give it all to the Lord. We may not have very much to give, but we give it all to the Lord. Thank you, ladies, for that. As I mentioned earlier, we're glad to have a missionary family with us from the Philippines. One of our uh, missionaries, uh, veteran missionaries, I think uh, 15, 16 years, you folks have been uh, missionaries here at the church, uh, Brother John Mason and his wife Christy, and I think the children are next door. Uh, but Brother John's going to come and share with us tonight and uh, give you an update concerning the work that God's doing through them there in the Philippines. It's so good to have you tonight. Thank you, Pastor. And it is good to be with you guys, uh, with y'all uh, this evening. Good to see you. It's uh, the last time we were here was 2014. And a lot has happened over the past eight years. A lot has happened to your auditorium here. I, we can see the difference. I've, I kind of forgot most everything, but my wife said, you know, I, I think this was a little bit different. And of course, Pastor showed us the beautiful recreation center in the back. And and hearing some of the plans, it is just awesome to see what the Lord is doing through you guys here in Piedmont. And uh, so Pastor asked if I'd share a little bit about the ministry. Uh, we're still working on getting the prayer card set up, still working on getting the video presentation and things like that. I had some uh, ideas for tonight, and then I think I left the flash drive either at the house or in the car. It fell in. I have no idea what happened to it. So we'll just, uh, I'll share with you a little bit. Uh, uh, just what's happened over the past eight years so you have an idea I'll share with you what our plans are for right now until we go back to the uh, till we go back to the Philippines in October just so you have an idea and uh, Lord willing we'll be able to see you a little bit later on maybe in the summertime and have some other information uh, for you guys at that time about 10 years ago all right so eight years ago we've been over in the Philippines 10 years ago we were still in the Philippines but the first ministry we're church planners and so our goal is to start churches. Our goal is to train a pastor and then turn the ministry over to him. In other words, we do the foundational work. You know, if you're in construction, you know what I'm talking about. You're doing the footings. You're doing all that cement work down at the bottom. 
you're getting things ready for the next person that's going to take the ministry on. Kind of like uh, uh, you think about a little bit like a Moses. And, you know, he, he led him out of Egypt. And then you think about Joshua. He led him into the promised land. And it's kind of that idea. We're, we're kind of like a Moses. We're down at the, the base. You know, we're getting that foundation good and solid. So when the next pastor comes in and he's ready to take it, he's ready to roll. He's ready to go on. That's the whole idea of a church planner. Well, 10 years ago, uh, I was, you know, we were in the ministry over in Pogutput in Locos Norte. Now, to help you understand, uh, the Philippines, a lot of islands. But if you look at a map, we're at the far, far north, as far as you can go without falling off the island. That's where we are. And actually, the area we are at, we are on the mountain side. We're kind of on the mountains, but you can see the ocean because everywhere in the far north is either mountain and right next to the ocean. But 10 years ago, we're over in Pogutput ministering there. I had a pastor that called me up and he said uh, from the main city, about 65 miles south of us. And he said to me, he said, uh, I got a ministry over in a tribal area. It's called Dumoneg up in the mountains. And uh, he said, we don't have a pastor that can go over there. Something happened with the man that was there. And he said, you got any men in your church that could go over, take this ministry over? I said, give me a little bit of time. Let's pray about this. And uh, we did have some men in the church 10 years ago. And so I talked to them. I said, all right, we'll take over this ministry for you, pastor. They had a little small lot and a little small building. And, uh, but nonetheless, they, that's what they had. Not much going on there. It's just basically they just started. And uh, so I sent a guy over from the church every Sunday in the afternoon to hold services. And also we would go soul winning on Saturday. We go soul winning. Uh, he would go over there and go soul winning on Saturday. And then the whole group of us, all the men would go over there one other day during the week. And we kept on doing that. Well, that, happened, that was about maybe a year and a half. And then 2014, we came over for a furlough. That was the last time we saw you guys and you all. And so what we did is my idea was, you know how we are. We have our own ideas about what, what was going to happen. My idea was when we went back after the furlough, we're going to go back to uh, the first ministry. We're going to continue on there. We're going to continue to train men and send them out to start different churches. But while we were here in the, in the U.S., the Lord made it known to me, that's not my plan for you guys. You're truly church planters, you know? And so he said, I, I, you need to leave the ministry and you need to go to Dumoneg. That's the area where we were just were. Uh, you need to go to Dumoneg and you need to get that ministry going there. Because one of the things you, it's kind of interesting to understand, in the Philippines, if you don't live in the area where you're ministering, it just, it won't happen. You know what I'm saying? If you don't live there, it's not going to happen. Sometimes I would have pastor friends over there and they'd say, yeah, I got a ministry a couple hours from here. And then the pandemic hit and nobody could travel and the ministries just collapsed. And so if you're not in a ministry and you're not with the people, you know what I'm saying? You got to be with the people. You got to get to know them. You got to earn their trust. The ministry will collapse. And that's what was happening. Because it was the guy we were sending over, he lived about, you know, 15 miles away. And I know that's not far for us here, but over in the Philippines, it's far. <laughs> and uh, so he'd go over there. And, uh, and so the Lord made it known, you guys need to go. You all need to go over there. You need to get this ministry, set this ministry in order. So back in 2014, I guess it was October time frame, we came back. Uh, we came back uh, to the Philippines, went back to the Philippines. And we went to the first ministry and we began to set it in order to turn it over. We had trained two men to be pastors. And one of the men, God made it clear to me that he is to be the pastor of that church. His name is Jonathan Agonoy. And so we turned that ministry over to him. We had an ordination service for him first. He went with uh, various pastors in the Ilocos Norte area. And they had a question and answer time to verify that he was fully qualified. And after the question and answer time, they said, yes, he's qualified to be a pastor. And so we had an ordination service and we set him in place as the pastor of that ministry. And that means we can go over to the next ministry over in Dumoneg. And, uh, uh, and so first thing about that ministry, the first ministry, God's doing great things. That ministry is growing. The first ministry, we've turned it over. We still fellowship, of course. We're not that far away. So we do meet up occasionally for various fellowships, uh, youth activities, things like that. But he has taken that ministry over 
that church is growing. That church is growing. They have a campsite up on top of the mountain behind their church now. Uh, they have additional couples that have joined the church, a good youth program. They got uh, a deaf ministry there. They're doing it. He's doing a great job. That's what it's all about. You know what I'm saying? That's what church plan's all about. And so we're excited about that. When we started the ministry in Dumanek, I had told Christy, I said, this is going to be a tough ministry. It's going to be tough. It's going to be harder than the first one. And you say, why? Why do you think? Because the ministry, it's a tribal area. And, and you can imagine the tribal idea. They have their own language, you know, so it's not just Tagalog, the Filipino language. And then where we are is Ilocano, another language. And then, no, they have a third one. They speak Yapaya. And uh, so we, we knew it was going to be challenged because in a, in a tribal situation, they're just kind of, it's like a big family, you know, really tight. Everybody's interrelated and you get the idea, you offend one. He offended them all, you know, that sort of idea. And, and so we knew it was going to be tough, but we could see God opening doors. Again, how do you find a house? You know, it's not like you have a rental, you know, a, a rental sheet over in the Philippines. Basically, you find a house by talking to a few people. Hey, you know of any vacant houses available? You know of any vacant houses nobody's living? And so eventually somebody was able to talk with me. He said, yeah. I said, we've seen a house up at the top of the mountain. Nobody's there right now, or I think the owner's in Manila, something like that. He said, why don't you talk with his wife? Gave me the number. There you go. Got an open door. You know, so now we're in. Now we got a place to stay. And so how do you start a church, right? What do you do when you start a church? Well, you got to get to know the people. That's, that's what you're getting ready to do, right? You're having some soul winning training right now, and then March 5th, you're getting ready to go out. Well, you got to get to know the people. So pretty much my, as a church planner, that's what I do all the, all, every day. You know, I have a little bit of time, a preparation of lessons, uh, reading the Bible, things like that. And then you just go out in the afternoon. You start talking to people on the street. You start sharing, giving out gospel tracts. You knock on a few doors. You see who's available. You share who you are, what you're there for. And you just start getting to know the people. So we did that. Of course, everybody's a little standoffish, you know. They call me the porao, which means the white, the white person. <laughs> so the porao. And they say, so what is this? And uh, I'll share with you right now a few of the stories of the main people in the church. Right at, toward the beginning of the ministry, there was a young lady named Ursi Kamali. Recent graduate of college in special needs. She worked with special needs and uh, very good in English. And so she would come by the house with several other teen girls. She's like top of her class, you know, graduated with honors, all that sort of thing. Very knowledgeable. And she'd come by the house. I would be gone. She'd talk with Christy, my wife, and, and the kids, and she'd say, why are you guys here? You know, what are you here? Why are you in our community? And so Christy would share a little bit, and one day, Praise the Lord, I happened to be home, or I came home while they were still there. And she asked me that question, you know, this time in uh, the, the local dialect. And she asked me the question, and I said to her, I said, because you need Jesus. You know, we're going straight, we're going to go straight for the jugular. You know what I'm saying? They, they need the truth. I said, because you need Jesus. What, what does that mean? And I said, because you're a sinner. And I had an opportunity to share the gospel pretty in depth with her that, that evening. And she thought about it. She did not trust in Christ that evening, but she did a few days later to my recollect. And she trusted in Christ. And yes, there was immediate persecution. Immediate persecution. Her family basically put her out. That's what happened. Uh, put her out. Her other classmates started laughing at her. Wouldn't have anything to do with her. The only ones that would have anything to do with her were the teens that came to church along with her. And when her family put her out, she had no place to go, so she came and stayed with us for a while. And that was a challenge, but while she was there, and staying with us, we're helping her grow spiritually, we're working with her to grow spiritually. While she was there, we invited a missionary, a Filipino missionary going to uh, Vietnam, Ho Chi Minh City. He came by and she told us after the service, I believe God's calling me to be a missionary as well. What should I do? I said, well, Ursi, you need some Bible training. Why don't, we, why don't we send you to Bible school in Manila? Get you trained there. That way she has good influence, right? She's with 
other young ladies uh, to, to learn about the Bible, and it's a good influence instead of the community which is just literally beating her down. And so we sent her there. She got a, like a two-year degree and uh, just started growing. Very helpful in all matters. I mean, it, we praise the Lord to her. Because of her testimony, many of the teens that are faithful, college students right now, are still in the ministry because of her testimony. And so we worked with her. We met a Filipino family that is also missionaries in Ho Chi Minh City and uh, got together with them. And right now she's been in Ho Chi Minh City. She's been in Vietnam for three years now, a missionary out of the church. And that's, that's a blessing. That is just a blessing, uh, uh, what is Ursi is doing right now. We occasionally talk with her a little bit and just hear what she's doing. It's been a challenge, of course, you can imagine, uh, in a communistic country, especially with this COVID stuff. And, yeah, they locked down pretty hard. But they have still been able to keep on going and still reaching people. And so that's one of the big blessings. Another family that was a big blessing to us was uh, Charlie Marr and Emily uh, Castro. A young couple when we met them. They are probably, the, the girl was maybe 16 years old, had a child, and uh, they're just kind of floundering around in their life, not sure what to do. So we met them, shared the gospel with them, and uh, they both trusted in Christ at that time. But we found out later that only the young lady, she understood, and she truly grasped the salvation. Well, they continued on in church. When they hit the age of 18, uh, we were able to help them get married, get them settled, get them going strong, you know. And they're in church. They're faithfully. Uh, because they're faithful to church, uh, we started teaching them, uh, training them how to teach the children and uh, how to do that. And so they wanted to teach the children. And they continue to do this all over the past, over the past seven years. They did this faithfully. A big help to the ministry. But one year ago, one year ago, Charlie Marr came up to me and he said, Pastor, he said, just this couple days ago, he said, I trusted in Christ to be my Savior. Whoa. One year ago, you know, I said, really? And so I asked him what the story was. He said, you know, when you talked to us before, even though you explained it all, I still thought I was getting saved. I still thought baptism was washing my sins away. That's what I thought. He said, I know that's not what you said. But that was what was ingrained in my mind because of the church I grew up in. He said, but I, he was teaching the kids. And all the lessons are salvation lessons for the, for the, for the most part. We kind of set them up that way because we're trying to get the gospel into the minds of the children so that as they get older, they'll understand. And he said, I'm teaching about salvation, but I'm not saved. I'm teaching these how to be saved and I'm not saved. And he said he went home after church one evening and God was just, just working in his heart. The Holy Spirit's just working. And he said, after the family went to bed, I got my Bible out, started reading it, started talking to God. I got it settled. Settled it long ago, right? As the song says. And just as Paul said, I know whom I have believed. And I tell you what, talking about a difference. You know, for seven years he was there and he, he's, he's teaching, he's helping out with various things. He's great in construction. He really is. And a uh, very skilled worker. He, and he's there. But you know something? Once he got saved, once he got saved, there was a difference this past year. Now he wanted to reach his family. I'd been always telling him, Charlie Marr, we need to get over to your family. They lived in a different city. We need to go over there, share the gospel, because they're way out in the middle of nowhere. I said, we need to get out there. And he'd say, yeah, yeah, we do, but I don't know if they want to hear the gospel. He'd say stuff like that. I don't know. They're probably not interested in the gospel. That's what he would tell me. But we need to, Charlie Marr. This is important. No. But when he got saved, what do you think he said? My dad, my mom need to know this. And so we, he started going over. I said, Charlie Marr, this is all you. I said, man, we'll, we'll support you. We'll, we'll get you over there. You go on over there. Take some of the teens with you. you go te the teens can teach the, the young kids over in the community. You can talk with your family. So every Monday night, he started going over there. You know, every Monday night. And uh, then right before we were getting ready to come back here to the, to the States, he said to me about, this is probably now about two months ago. He said, Pastor, can you come and talk with my parents? I've been sharing the gospel, but it's like something's missing. I don't know. And I said, well, I'd be honored. 
You know, so I went over with him one evening and, uh, and his dad asked me, because I knew his dad, I say, he said, why are you here? And I said, well, actually I'm here because your son cares for your soul, you know? And so I had the opportunity to share the gospel to his father, Charlie Mar's father and his, and his wife, and they both trusted in Christ that evening. Uh, she, I didn't think the, the, his, uh, I didn't think that his, uh, Charlie Mar's mother was interested, but boy, after a little while, she stopped cooking. She came over, sat down, started listening, started answering questions, you know, trusted in Christ to be the Savior. And wow, we found out about a month ago as well that somebody in the community had told Charlie Murray, hey, I got a little piece of property over here. You want to build a little lean-to, something like that, what we call a kubo kubo over there, like post, a couple posts, and then you have the, the uh, like uh, uh, palm leaves. He said, if you want to build something like that, whatever size you want, so you can hold little Bible studies, go ahead. What a blessing. That's what Charlie, that he has been a blessing to us. And it's just great to see what he and his wife are doing and, and what they're doing right now. Uh, another a young lady in the church is uh, named Mimi. Mimi was one of the first who trusted in Christ back 10 years ago. But she was kind of, you know, she'd be faithful to church on Sunday morning. But that'd be pretty much it. But God started working in her heart over this past couple years. And literally what happened is, is uh, she said, I, my husband's not saved. My husband's not. How, how can I reach my husband if I'm not walking with God? You know, I'm, I'm trying to tell my husband this is important to him. And he's looking at me and saying, if it's so important for you, why aren't you at church today? Oh, that's pretty tough. Isn't it? Yeah, that's pretty hard. <laughs> when you're sitting at the house and your husband says to you that's not saved, hey, you should be at church right now. Why aren't you over there? Oh, that's brutal. And she, she said, she said, she made a commitment. I'm going to start being faithful. And because of her faithfulness, she, she, of course, she wanted to start teaching her kids. Her one daughter trusted in Christ to be her savior. And Christy started training Mimi to be a teacher, a Sunday school teacher for the youth. And Mimi's doing well. She has a good character. She really does. We're still praying for her husband. He has not yet trusted in Christ. Her husband is a, is a solid tribal person, a solid tribal male. And, and we have a, it's, it's hard to reach the tribal male people over there. And so Mimi has been a big blessing because of Mimi's testimony, right? Starting to walk with God, being faithful. Her brother over in another town noticed it. He was going to like a, uh, a Church of Christ church, which believes in believers' baptism over there. And he was going to a church like that, and he's like, man, what's different in your life? Yeah, that's what he said. He said, I see difference in your life. I don't get it. It's not happening to me. It's not happening at our church. I want to know what's going on. So she invited him to a Valentine's banquet a couple years ago, a year ago or so. And uh, so he came on over. So I talked with him, and then a month later, this is this past March, I, I was able to catch him uh, at the house and share the gospel with he and his wife. And his wife trusted in Christ that evening. Jim Boy, though, he said, you know, i, I got to think about this a little bit. He had, he had a lot of things going on in his mind. But after I left that evening, it was probably about 7, 7.30 that evening, his sister, Mimi, kept on working with him, helping him understand, explaining it to him until he trusted in Christ. And now Jim Boy and Jim Lynn are faithfully going to church. And Jim Boy has a burden for their family, which is in another city. And their city, that, that's a little, it's, it's kind of a rural area. You, you take a single motor, like a dirt bike over there. Then you go up a little mountain, go down a mountain. Then you park your motorcycle. And then you walk up a mountain and walk back down again. That's where his family is. And uh, so we've been, we've been able to share the gospel to his grandmother who trusted in Christ and one of his aunts. I mean, it's just, again, you know what I'm talking about. When the gospel gets into a person's heart, man, I'm, there's a difference. And they want to get the gospel. Pastor, what time is it? Just so I don't go too long. 20 minutes. All right. So we praise the Lord for Jim Boy and Jim Lynn. And those are some of the key people in the church right now. Now, the question probably some of you have, all right, if you're here, pastor, right, then what's happening over there? Who's the pastor? Isn't that the question? That's, that's got to be the obvious question for many people, and that's a good question. Well, I'll share with you a little bit. Two years ago, 
we believed the Lord would have us take a furlough. I was praying about it, right? So six years ago and praying about it, but God made it very clear, no. It was just clear as can be. As we were praying about it, no. And I kind of know why, because right after that is when this uh, pandemic hit. And uh, so we praise the Lord for the opportunity to carry on the ministry through that time. The Lord was gracious to us. We, it was a battle. It was a spiritual battle. And I know the challenge is here. I know it's challenging for you guys. And, and uh, it, it, in a communist country, you can imagine, it's just a mess. And, and we literally battled with, the, I felt like I was battling the officials. And you don't want to battle the officials. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not what, what you want to do. And, and I felt like that. But I praise the Lord that they pretty much left us alone. We only had four services that I think it was four, yeah, four services that we were not allowed to meet. And then after that, they just kind of left us alone. And uh, they really did. And so we were able to continue on with the ministry. We were able to continue on with all the programs. And the Lord was gracious to us in everything that happened. And praise the Lord, you know, we, there was some COVID that did go through our area. Uh, it did, it didn't, it wasn't a, it, it, it seemed like in our area it wasn't a severe strain uh, there wasn't a lot of heavy sicknesses, that sort of thing. It was pretty mild for the most part. It, you know, they, they're different strains. It's kind of hard to explain, but we praise the Lord for that. But anyway, so that was two years ago. One year ago, we began to pray and ask the Lord the same thing. Lord, what about this year? Is this the year to go? And so while I'm in my devotions one day in the book of Luke, I'm reading the parable that, uh, you know, the parable about the, the, the tree that's not, not bearing fruit, right? And then so what do we cut it down? And the, and the gardener said, no, let us let us dung it a little bit. Let's put some uh, let's put some fertilizer around it, you know, some manure around it. Let's see what will happen. And God spoke to me that day to let me know, no, that's what you're going to do for this next year. You need to fertilize this ministry because we, we haven't been able to train a person to be a pastor. And like I mentioned, these people that I mentioned to you just earlier, most of it happened in this past year. Most of it. You know, Charlie Marr getting saved, Mimi becoming really faithful, Jim Boy and Jim Lynn. Uh, of course, Ursi's already in Vietnam. I mean, this just happened the past year. And uh, it's just wow. And so anyway, so we're, we're thinking about this. And so we knew as this year came to a close this past year, all right, what are we going to do? I had a friend of mine, a guy I was praying with, talking about down in Manila, maybe he could come up. But it didn't happen, didn't work out. All right, you may have gotten our, third, our December prayer letter about that. And, and that was December when I found out it just it wasn't a wise decision. So now what am I going to do? And as I'm, I'm literally just begging God, God, I, you know, I need an answer. I need an answer. I need to know because we're leaving January 28, 28. That's our flight date. We're coming over. And now it's December 15th, 16, you know, 20, something like that. And that, we, don't, we don't have a lot of time here. What am I going to do, Lord? And so I'm begging God, and, and God made it clear to me. He said, you know, just as I entrusted this ministry to you eight years ago, ten years ago, you know another pastor, he called me up, said, I got a ministry for you. Can you take it over? He said, God said, that's exactly what I want you to do with this ministry as well. There was another pastor in our area a little ways away, and uh, a little ways away from us, but he had just started his ministry when the pandemic hit. And so you can imagine, it's, you really, it's hard to keep it going. You know what I'm saying? And it's hard to visit. It's hard to do all of that. And so he's, he was struggling. And I knew it. And I, and I, I talked with him occasionally. And, and he, he was solid in soul winning, solid in his doctrines. And uh, his wife, they're from the locals North Bay. So they speak the language, you know. And, and uh, so really good. And. And so the Lord said to me, made it known, you need to turn this ministry over to him. That's what you need to do. Turn it over. And you can imagine, you know, for eight years, you poured your heart out into the people, you know, prayed for them. We still pray for them and the teens and the youth that come faithfully and and all these that are so precious to you. And then just turn it over, Lord. Is that, is that what it is? God said, yes, this is the person that can take this ministry on to perfection. You know, as the book of Hebrews talks about, let's go on to maturity. 
Let, that's, this is the person to do it. So I did. I talked with the man. I talked with his uh, senior pastor. We kind of lined it up, and basically the ministry has turned over. We turned it over. We had some special, we had some services together, you know, to kind of get things uh, organized and set in order. Had a special service to turn the ministry over. And the man's name is Woody Gabino. And uh, we're, 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 we're pleased. Of course, you can imagine with any transfer like that, there's some issues that come up. Uh, it's just part of life. And so he's dealing with some of those things right now. But, you know, we have the Holy Spirit in our life, right? To guide us through these things. And uh, just as Paul said, I, I, I leave you. He told the uh, elders there. He said, I leave you to God's word and his spirit. And that's what it is. And so we turned the ministry over. And uh, we also, we, we let go of everything. Um, the Lord said, we're, we're talking about it. What are we going to do? Christy and I were talking, what are we going to do with our stuff? And I said, you know, I'll be honest with you. This is something the Lord's been working in my heart. You know, we believe in the rapture, don't we? We, we all say that. We really believe in the rapture. We believe it could happen right now. And yet sometimes we don't really live that way, do we? And I said, you know, if we're going to be gone for nine months before we come back to the Philippines to start a new ministry, and we have all this various items, various stuff over there that we used, and it's just going to sit and nobody's going to use it? I said, you know, it'd be better if we just gave it to somebody else, oh, the ministries, right? The two ministries, so they can use all that stuff because we don't know, the Lord may come back. You know, and just as the Lord provided all those things for us over the first, you know, during that time, He can do it again. And what did He say? The Lord, what did Job say? The Lord live, giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. So that's what we did. We distributed the things to the different churches and stuff like that and, and uh, prepared to come over. The story of coming over was just uh, a story of God's hand. Literally, two weeks before we wanted to getting ready to travel down to Manila, drive down to Manila, get the airplane out, we got COVID. <laughs> it hit our family. Two weeks. Can you imagine that? Two weeks before that. You know, two weeks. Kind of ironic. I it got it from my son, our oldest son, Hudson. And we went, we went to a Bible study, and there was somebody there that had just come back from a wedding. And it was known that there was probably some COVID cases. And uh, so it came in. It went through our family. It wasn't a heavy, it wasn't a strong thing, you know. Um, it is kind of uh, just some uh, flu-like symptoms. And it hit Christy the hardest. She had a little cough for a while. But nonetheless, so the Lord is gracious. We, we went down to Manila, but you got to have testing. You know what I'm saying? You got to have testing. They won't let you into the U.S. without being tested. And so we went to get our first testing. And uh, the day that we're flying out, because it has to be 24 hours. That's the requirement. And all of us tested, uh, well, there was, there's five of us. Three of us tested negative, two of, two of them were positive, Christy and Kyla. Like, oh no, you know, they're not gonna let us on the plane. What are we gonna do? So we go out in the car, we're praying, Lord, you know what? Uh, are we gonna are we gonna do the quarantine for another week here in the Philippines? Reschedule the flight? What do we do? And, and the Lord made it clear. We prayed about it. Get another test because those tests are kind of weird sometimes. So we did. The next test, they were negative. So praise the Lord, we're ready to go. And uh, Amen. So we used the, the test from the one and Kyla and Christie's test from the other. We go to the airport. We're waiting there, and guess what? They overbooked the flight. <laughs> But that's okay. The Lord, they put us up in a hotel that night, and it was, we needed the rest, to be honest with you. We were pretty worn out from all the mess there. So we needed the rest, and they were very gracious to us. But we had to get tested again, right? You had to be tested again, because now the first tests are not valid, because it got away 24 hours. So we go to the testing site again, right near the airport. We test. I'm talking to the, the boss guy and sharing the gospel with him a little bit. And, and so we all go through the test. This time we're all negative, except for Christy. She's positive, they said. And so I was like, oh, okay. 
But what are we going to do? But anyways, the guy motioned to Christy. I'm talking to the guy, and he motioned to Christy back in the room. And I didn't know any of this. You know, I'm, I'm clear of this. And he said to her, he said, your whole family's negative. He said, you're the only one positive, but you don't have any symptoms. You're kind of asymptomatic, you know, because he was doing okay. And he said, so I'm just going to give you negative so you guys can get on the flight and go home. And so, amen. Amen. And that, that's what God did. And you know... The time that we were supposed to fly, the time that we were floating, is when that big snowstorm hit up in, up in uh, New, New England area, right? And we were flying into JFK, so we, could, we wouldn't have been able to get out anyways. And so the next day, we came in the day after, right? And at that time, everything was cleared up, and so we had no problems getting in. And so God was just, it's just showing His hand, showing that His greatness, His goodness, which He is, right? We know that. That's what it's all about. And uh, we are planning to stay here right now for nine months. I know it's uh, last time we were only here for six months, and that was because of our visa. This time, uh, our visa has to be renewed every November. And you don't want to lose your visa right now. There are a lot of missionaries from the Philippines that are stuck in the States right now. They can't go back because they, they only allow you. Well, right now, they're opening up again. Right now. But before, they wouldn't let you back in. It didn't matter unless your visa was uh, active. So a lot of missionaries we came home, right? And then their visa expired. They couldn't get back in. We wouldn't let them back in, so they're stuck. So you don't want to lose your visa status. We'll be going back in October. That way we can get our papers together and uh, get things settled up. What are, you, what are we going to do while we're here? You say, well, the nine months is a lot of time. Well, we do need to visit our, uh, our churches. We have churches, uh, maybe 23 or 24 churches. Most are either here in the south or up in Connecticut, Pennsylvania. And so we're trying to schedule it out where we'll be like a month down here. Or we'll be a month up there. And then come down here for a month. And you say, why do you want this month thing? Well, to be honest with you, we want to help out in the ministries. We want to help out. We really do. Um, I'm not one that sits around. I don't like to sit. You know what I'm saying? I just, when you're, when you're, when you're a church planning pastor, man, you're just, you're, you're just constantly moving. And, and so I don't like to sit. So I want to get involved. I want our kids to be involved with ministries here as well. That's why the kids in the, in the, in the various classes to interact, to see, to see the ministry. So we want to join in with soul winning. You know, we'd love to join, come out with you guys on Saturday when you have soul winning. Do a little soul winning with you. If you have other activities, Pastor, we can help out in any way. And that's what we want to do. We're staying at my brother's house right here in Piedmont, we're over off Sunny Lane. And that's where we're staying right now. When we go up to Connecticut, um, there's, a, there's a friend of mine from our sending church up there that is starting a ministry in New Haven. And he's already asked. He said, we need your help. Can you help us out starting this ministry? So, hey. While we're up there, we're going to be soul winning, doing a church plan up there. They also have a Filipino ministry up in Connecticut because uh, right around New Haven, uh, there's a lot of Filipino nurses and doctors up there. And so they have a Filipino ministry. And of course, while we're up there, we can teach the Sunday school classes as well. And so that's our, that's our desires. Uh, when it comes to summertime for the camps, things like that, man, we want to be a part, get our kids to the camps, let them experience this sort of thing, the camps here, and be involved. If we can teach, if we can help, we can visit, whatever we can do. That's our goal until the month of October. And yes, we are here. One of the big things we're here for is to see our family. You know that. It's been eight years. Uh, both of Christy and I's parents are getting up in age. And my parents, you know my parents, Bill and Nancy Mason, they're, they're 80. They're doing well. They're still faithful in the ministry. And, uh, but I, I can see they're, 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 they're getting a little bit weaker, as they say. Christy's father's been struggling with cancer. Uh, he lives over in Williamston. And uh, so uh, he's had both of his legs amputated. And so we're not able to see him right now because he just had some services, uh, some things done in the hospital. And so they advised him, you know, wait two weeks that way before you meet anybody. So we're holding off before we see him. And, uh, but that's, that's kind of what's going on right now with our lives. And when we go back, you say, where are you going? Well, we're praying about an area called Panchen Pasali. And it's, it's all the way up in the top again, but it's the very last, uh, I guess you might say, city before you cross over on the other side of the Philippines. Like, in other words, if this is the Philippines right here, you know, and you have the middle, which is mountainous in the middle, well, we're on this side. 
We're on the west, uh, yeah, on the west side. And before on the east side is on the Pacific Ocean side. So we're on the West China Sea or the Philippine Sea as they call it. That's the side we're on. But we're going to work in the ministry uh, right on the border. And it's a mountainous area. It's a very rural area. The, the trades there are fishing. They have little boats they take out all the time. Fishing, farming, and those are the main uh, uh, trades industry in that area. But there's no gospel, min there's no gospel uh, church there. There's no gospel preaching church. And I've been burdened for a while. We tried to start some things there, but every time, God closed the door. God closed the door. But as we're praying about it, it looks like God's getting ready to open the door. And so we are excited. We are excited about getting back there, starting new, starting fresh. It's like 16 years ago when we went over to the Philippines, you know, starting new and uh, getting those foundations going. It's fun to do the foundation work, you know, it really is. It's a challenge because, you know, brother, when you start the foundations, you got to get a solid foundation, right? If it ain't a solid foundation, especially with what's going on in the world today, all this crazy philosophies coming through today. If it's not a solid foundation, it will collapse. And we don't want that. That's not what God's desire, right? And so we're going to set a solid foundation, solid salvation, solid assurance, solid understanding of the Bible, how to read the Bible, get into the Bible, so that they can go out, start ministries, reach their families, because the foundation's been set. And Pastor, that's what we're doing. That's what God has called us to do. And and uh, we're just we're we are honored and privileged to be a part of your missions program here uh, from the very beginning you supported us and we we know that we you guys pray for us occasionally i would get an email from a couple for, uh, occasionally from you guys and just saying hey just letting you know we're praying for you we appreciate that we really do and uh lord willing you know later after we we're still working on our video and getting that's all set up and once we get that all set up some prayer cards We'll come back over again, show you the video. That way, some of the names that I mentioned, you'll see their faces. And you'll see what God has done through your prayers and support. Because everyone that is reached over there is part of your account. That's what it's all about. It's part of your account. In the ministry right now, there's, there's 27 saved and baptized that are faithful to the church right now there's generally there's about 25 children that come on an average sunday so it's like 55 60 that come over there but 27 are saved and baptized and faithful and they know it. they can share the gospel that's fruit to your account that's what it's all about that's missions and that's what's so exciting right reach the gospel pastor that's what we'd like to share here Isn't it exciting to hear that God's still saving people outside of Piedmont? And uh, trust that you'll pray for that ministry, that God would uh, bless the work that's already established and then uh, the work that is to be established. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, this is a great big old world, and a lot of people just still don't know Jesus. And you think, I mean, you know, you hear people all talk about all the time, oh, there's missionaries in the Philippines and whatever else. Philippines is not just like Piedmont. It's islands. There's people being born, people dying every day, and there's places, brothers, you said, that there's not even a gospel witness that's anywhere there, and so certainly be praying for this work, that God will continue that, amen, all right, well, it's prayer time, and uh, we certainly want to be praying for the Masons, that the Lord would bless them uh, in their time that they're home, but also the ministry that uh, he is uh, calling them to there, and uh, wonder if you may have some prayer requests tonight you'd care to share with us, we'll start over on my left and your right. Go right up the aisle there. Prayer request. Yes, ma'am. So do 
to be praying for Sister Wendy McAbee. This dear lady, of course, has been undergoing treatments, both radiation and chemo, and uh, certainly we'll be praying for God to, to give grace and help her in this this uh, situation that's there. Any other requests on this side? Yes, ma'am, Ms. Kent. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Any others? In the center section, prayer boys. Yes, ma'am. Send the hospital. Great. Continue to pray. Yes, Miss Gina. Yes, Miss Pritchard. Okay. All right, over on this side, this section. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. 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 Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you for that. Well, I'm glad the Lord knows the spoken as well as the unspoken tonight. So let's go to Him in prayer and just ask for His guidance, His direction, His wisdom in uh, each of these situations. And uh, do do continue to pray for a uh, friend of ours. Uh, this lady, she's been in the hospital for the last several weeks, Miss uh, Abby Harrison. And uh, the good news, her, her husband contacted us, and she, of course, at one time was on 100% uh, life support, and uh, now it's down to 65%, so she is being, beginning to make a little bit of progress. But uh, be praying for them. They've got a, a little girl. Uh, their uh, mom is not with uh, her, and then, of course, the daddy's having to take time off of work in order to, to take care of their so some special needs that are there. But they both know the Lord and want to serve Him, and God's aware of what's going on. And we praise Him for every little bit of progress that she's making. So certainly be praying for this family as well. Right. well let's, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Continue to remember our service personnel. That the Lord protect them. Amen. Absolutely. Amen. I could preach here, but I, I won't. But you know every bit of this is just getting us ready for the sound of the trumpet. And uh, we're getting closer and closer. And these are not things that we would want to see. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I don't like high gas prices. But uh, that's all part of it. And, uh, you know, all of the different things that are there. But it just, just means we're closer to the coming of the Lord. And uh, so uh, that, that just, uh, just stay faithful. Amen. Just trust Him with that. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you tonight for what our ears have heard concerning the work that you're doing in the Philippines there. And thank you for the faithfulness of Brother and Sister Mason and their family. Lord, as they've gone and labored. And Lord, we thank you for the church having a part in that all of these many years. And every soul that has been saved 
every life that has been touched, every person that's heard the gospel, every seed that has been planted, uh, Lord, uh, is fruit to this ministry. And Lord, I pray that you bless Brother and Sister Mason as they're here and Lord, as they travel about to report to their churches, as they labor, Lord, as they look forward to this uh, new ministry that you have for them. And Father, I pray that you'd keep your hand of protection and blessing upon them. Lord, for all of these requests that have been made known tonight, the unspoken requests, as well as the spoken. Lord, you know the physical needs and the spiritual needs. Lord, we pray that you would just give that which is needed in each life. Lord, for those that are seeking to minister care, I pray that you would help them and give them that patience they need. And Lord, I pray for uh, each of these, Lord, that you would just raise them up as a testimony of your healing power. Father, we pray for those that have loved ones that are near to death, that you would give unto them that grace and help that they stand in need of. And then, Father, we do pray tonight for our nation. Father, you know the mess that we're in. But, Lord, we know that your word teaches us that sometimes you raise up a leader in order to bring judgment upon us, as well as times you bring, raise up a leader to bring about good. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help our nation to look unto you and to realize, Lord, it's not about uh, the bombs that we have or the money that we have. It's not our security to protect ourselves. But, Lord, it's you. And, Father, we need you tonight. And I pray that we as your people we dedicate ourselves afresh, Lord, to just being the witnesses that we need to be. Father, that we could be able to be a witness for Christ in this community as well as around the world. Now again, Father, we pray that you dismiss us with your love and care. Give us a good night and a good week. Help us to be a witness for Christ. Look forward to the opportunity of coming and being in your house again on Sunday. Lord, for all that you do and all that you have done, we're going to praise and give you honor and glory. We make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I trust you'll come by and speak to the Masons. If you have any questions, I'm sure they would be glad to answer those for you. But be working and praying. We'll look forward to seeing you in the house of the Lord on Sunday morning. Good night.